Hello internet users and welcome back to another video. If you're a fan of Pokemon, then odds are you're probably aware that the Generation 1 games have more than a few glitches. For years now, I've been showcasing some of the most broken glitches and design oversights in the series. However, today, I want to do something a little bit different and instead focus on some of the smaller and some of the lesser known mistakes in these games. It's always fun for me to go over something broken in Gen 1, but there are several bugs and issues that don't really come up in my other videos, because they're just too small and specific to ever be worth mentioning. You can't use any of these to sequence break, softlock, or mess around with the save file in any significant way. They're nothing more than weird pieces of trivia that the majority of players will never even notice, even after playing the games several times. With that said, in no particular order, here are some of my favorite smaller glitches and mistakes in Pokemon Gen 1. Number 1, The Pokemon Fan Club Oversight To get us started, let's talk about something that fits the theme of this video perfectly, on a noticeable mistake within an unremarkable location. In Vermilion City, one of the buildings you can enter is the Pokemon Fan Club. In most playthroughs, you only spend about 10 seconds here just to speak to the chairman who gives you the bike voucher. But as it turns out, there is something a little special about this room. You see, in Red and Blue, the game incorrectly treats this area as a dungeon, like Mount Moon or Rock Tunnel. This means that you're able to use an escape rope in here, and immediately warp to the last used Pokemon Center. There isn't any trick or exploit that you can do with this, it's just a funny side effect of the game having the wrong data for the map. What's interesting though is that this was actually fixed in Pokemon Yellow version. Despite absolutely no one ever noticing or complaining about this mistake, they still went out of their way to fix it. I should also probably mention that you can expect to hear me bring up Pokemon Yellow a lot in this video. Because it was the last version of Gen 1 to be released, there were a large amount of bug fixes introduced. You might be surprised to find out just how many obscure issues were fixed in this version, despite it still containing several other bugs itself. Number 2, Wandering NPCs If you've ever played these games before, then something you've no doubt noticed is that there are many NPCs that move around randomly in the towns and cities. While it might seem like they're tethered to a small area, some of them are actually capable of moving very far from their spawn point. This normally isn't a big deal when leaving them on their own, but if you were to intentionally block their path, you can lead them into spots that can cause a few problems. For example, on Cinnabar Island, this woman here is set to randomly move either left or right, with the only boundary being the edge of the island itself. If you stand on her left side long enough, you can get her in front of the gym door. From here, if you walk in front of the door without the secret key, the game will attempt to push you down by one tile. Because this woman is now blocking that tile, the game will put you in a loop of repeatedly telling you that the door is locked while failing to move your character as intended. In this situation, it's not possible to open the menu between the forest text boxes. However, the game is still technically advancing a few frames at a time. If you sit there mashing the buttons for long enough, then the NPC will finally move again, letting you go free. However, if we change locations, we can find a different NPC that can actually break the game a little bit. At the very beginning of a playthrough, you can find this woman wandering outside of your house. While you may usually see her in this general area, she is able to move quite far from here. With a bit of patience, you can slowly guide her towards the northern exit of the map. Once she's standing right here, try to leave activating Professor Oak's cutscene. When Oak tries to escort you to his lab, the NPC will block some of your movement in the cutscene. Because of this, when the game forces you to move into the lab's door, you will be one tile off of your expected position. This puts your character into the wall, unable to move. Because you didn't hit the door tile, the game can't load the map for the lab's interior. This means that the cutscene cannot properly end, so no other buttons will work. In this situation, there is quite literally nothing to do except turn off the game. Number 3, Lieutenant Surge's Gym Puzzle This one right here is one of my favorite things to bring up whenever I'm streaming a Gen 1 playthrough, and if you follow speedrunning at all, you're likely to be familiar with this one as well. In the third gym, there is an infamous puzzle where you have to check garbage cans, looking for a randomly placed switch. Once you find it, you then have to find the second switch, which is then randomly placed in a can adjacent to the first. At least, that's how the puzzle is supposed to work. 
Apparently, the second switch is bugged, and 50% of the time, instead of being placed near the first can, it'll default to the first one in the room, which is the one in the top left corner. The game simply doesn't play by its own rules here, and if you don't know about this little piece of trivia, then you're often going to be checking nearby cans with no chance of getting it right. So even if this one is a bit more commonly known, I'm making sure that everyone gets to know about this so less people have to suffer through this unfair puzzle. Number 4, Kadabra's Forgotten Move. Even when the series first began, Pokemon have had a large list of moves available for them to learn. However, in the initial releases of Gen 1, there was a single move that the devs kinda forgot to include. Originally, Kadabra was meant to have the signature move Kinesis, which lowers an opponent's accuracy by one stage. But for some reason, it was not programmed to be a part of Kadabra's list of moves. But what makes this really hilarious though is the fact that Kinesis itself is still in the game's data. In red and blue, because it's unlearnable for its intended Pokemon, the only possible way to use it is for it to be rolled by using Metronome, which is a move that randomly selects and uses any move in the game. It wasn't until Pokemon Yellow version that this mistake was noticed and Kadabra was finally able to learn the move. However, because in yellow Kinesis is now listed as a default move for Kadabra, this means that it cannot ever have the move if the player evolved it from an Abra. So if you want a Kadabra with Kinesis, then you have to specifically go to the grass on Route 8 and catch a wild one because this is the only place in the entirety of Gen 1 where its level will be low enough to have the move. That's an incredible amount of nonsense just for an attack that functions as a discount sand attack. But while we're on the subject of signature moves, let's talk about one for another Pokemon. Number 5, Hitmonlee's Recoil Damage. If you're familiar with later Pokemon games, then you've probably heard of the moves Jump Kick and High Jump Kick. Both of these are fairly powerful attacks, with the downside of hurting the user if they happen to miss. In Gen 1, both of these moves were exclusive to the Pokemon Hitmonlee, and it had to level up quite a bit in order to have access to them. If you choose to use Hitmonlee in this game, you might be delighted to find out that the recoil damage of these attacks does not work properly. While the official description says that the recoil is an eighth of the damage that would have been dealt, instead, it's just one. When these attacks miss, you take a single point of damage, which really makes you wonder if they even bothered to test these at any point. What's also interesting about this though is that despite being aware of the problem, Game Freak actually intentionally left this glitch in Pokemon Yellow. This is because Yellow version still needed to be able to connect with Red and Blue. If Yellow had different data for its moves, then it could cause the games to desync and crash when battling each other. Something that should also be mentioned is that these two moves were not fixed in Pokemon Stadium. This is incredibly strange because this game was known for fixing several issues with Gen 1's battle system. And as you'll see later in this video, it also fixed some other moves that didn't work properly before. There is simply no way that they weren't aware of the bugged recoil damage by now. I can only speculate that they left it in, thinking that it would be too drastic to change at this point for competitive gameplay. But once the second generation of Pokemon began, the moves would finally start working as intended. Number 6, Standing on Water. This next one I find interesting because it's a glitch that can only happen when you make use of a mechanic that 99% of people don't even know exists. Normally, when you're surfing across water in these games, you re-enter the land tiles by simply moving onto them. But did any of you know, if you stand in front of a land tile, open up the party menu, and manually use Surf again, the game will put you back on land as well. Obviously, this is a much slower way of getting out of the water, so no one ever bothers to do this. However, there is actually a very small glitch that can occur when you manually bring yourself out of Surf mode like this. Whenever you attempt to do this, when there is something or someone occupying the land tile, you'll get a message telling you that it won't work. But for whatever reason, if your character is facing right, and the tile in front of you has an NPC on land, the game will incorrectly try to put you on land. As a result, you'll be standing on water, unable to move, until you surf again. I have absolutely no idea why this glitch happens only under these very specific circumstances, but there are only a handful of places in the game where it's even possible to do. Number 7, the impossible to obtain item. For this next one, let me once again bring up the secret item in the Safari Zone gate. Although the player cannot find and collect it, this map has data for a hidden nugget. 
How do we know that this item is here? Well, if you stand on this exact tile and use the item finder, it will alert you to its presence. But because it's located in the black void outside of the map, even if you were to use a glitch or something to walk there, the game would just crash. It's just sitting there out of bounds, with no way for the player to collect it. Number 8, Psychic's Missing Weakness. One of the most infamous blunders with Gen 1's type matchups was the fact that Psychic types were immune to ghost moves when they were supposed to be very weak against them. But what's even more funny and often overlooked is how Game Freak addressed this in Pokemon Yellow. As stated earlier in the video, in order to maintain compatibility with the earlier Gen 1 releases, all glitches related to the battle system had to be left as is, or it would cause even more problems. Although they couldn't correct this mistake properly, they instead changed a piece of dialogue to stop some players from getting confused. In Saffron City's gym, there's an NPC that talks about the weakness of Psychic-type Pokémon. In Red and Blue, they will say that the bug and ghost types work well against them, but in Yellow, the reference to ghost types will be dropped entirely. While it's not the most elegant solution to the glitch, it's interesting that this change shows that they were aware of the issue and tried to at least do something about it. Number 9, Fishing in Statues. This is probably one of the most infamous weird mistakes in Gen 1, but it's so silly that it's still worth mentioning briefly for the five people that still haven't heard of it. In Red and Blue, the game treats the bottom half of all gym statues as a water tile. This means that you can both fish and surf onto them. It makes no sense, and I can't even begin to wonder how something like this made it to release. And once again, I'll say that this was later fixed in Pokemon Yellow. Number 10, Focus Energy Doesn't Work. This next one is also pretty well known, but there's no way I can finish this video without including it. The move Focus Energy has a very simple effect. It's supposed to give your Pokémon a buff, increasing the likelihood of landing a critical hit. Unfortunately, someone made a very terrible mistake when putting the move into the game. While Focus Energy was supposed to quadruple the chances of critical hits, in reality, it actually quarters the chance instead. Unlike Hitmonlee's jump kicks though, there was no real way for anyone to notice this mistake in normal gameplay. The majority of players using the move, expecting critical hits, would likely just assume that they were unlucky. Luckily, this was later fixed in Pokémon Stadium, in every single Pokémon game released after that. Number 11, The Invisible PC. In Celadon City, there is a hotel in the southern part of the map. This location is almost completely unremarkable and has nothing for the player to do except to talk to a couple of NPCs. The only reason this building is remembered by some players is due to a funny little oversight in the right side of the room. As you can probably tell, this map is a slightly edited version of the one used in every Pokémon Center. In fact, it's such a blatant copy and paste that they forgot to remove the event tile that activates the PC. While they may have removed the PC itself, it can still be used by standing and facing where it should be. And as you may have guessed, this was another thing that was fixed in Yellow Version. Number 12, Chansey's Overworld Sprite. To end off this video, I want to talk about something I've personally noticed and haven't seen talked about online. Something that was added in Pokémon Yellow was a Chansey Sprite inside of every Pokémon Center, which stands next to the nurse. All of these Chansey will sit there, always facing south, and can be interacted with from across the counter. However, there is one Chansey in the game that stands out from the rest. In Fuchsia City, there's a Pokémon Zoo that takes up half the map. Throughout it, you can find various Pokémon on display, one of which is another Chansey. Of course, it makes perfect sense to use the Pokémon Center's Chansey Sprite here too, but I couldn't help but notice something peculiar about this one. While many other Pokémon in the zoo move around or turn in different directions, this one always stares south, like the ones in the Pokémon Center. So why do I think this counts as a mistake? Well, if you were to use something like glitches to get inside the cage, you can discover that the Chansey does in fact have sprites for when it's facing the other three directions. It's my theory that this Chansey was intended to behave like the other zoo Pokémon, but the devs copy and pasted a Chansey from a Pokémon Center, accidentally giving it the same behavior of always looking down. In fact, whenever you do interact with this Chansey, it will always go back to looking that way after a few seconds. This shows that it's clearly trying to face that direction and isn't just a default setting. 
and I can't say for certain what the devs intended for the Chansey, but because it never turns around on its own, this means that the other three sprites are impossible to see in normal gameplay. It seems weird to have bothered making them if the player was never meant to see them. By the way, I'm sure some of you are wondering about the text box with the exclamation mark. This is actually just placeholder text that all of the zoo Pokemon have when they're interacted with. Obviously, you're not meant to ever see this, but it's kind of funny that it makes it look like they're surprised at what you're doing. It's debatable whether or not this Chansey is really an oversight, but you can all let me know what you think in the comments below. And with that, I think I've covered just about everything I wanted to talk about for this video. I hope you all enjoyed. My name is Pekaspri, and thanks for watching.